So our next speaker is, uh, I guess we'd say from the home team, it's uh, Professor David Lane from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Uh, David has been one of the people who've really been sort of setting the agenda for RAS in, in the UK. He formulated and launched the UK's National RAS Innovation Strategy. Uh, and his day job is to run a 35 million pound joint venture in robotics, uh, between, a joint venture between Harriet Watt University and Edinburgh University. Uh, with some 30 leading researchers from around the world. Uh, I guess David will be known to many of you. Um, I won't uh, uh, rehearse all his achievements in any more detail because time is pressing. I'll leave the floor to David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to do a short rain dance here, uh, as we were saying earlier, to make, get the technology to work. And it has to be done in the right order, otherwise it doesn't work. So just bear with me while I do this. With luck, you won't get to see a hacker which is the other thing that might happen if I get it wrong. <laughs> there we go, right. Good, so, um, glasses always helps. I'll try and get it a bit better. Uh, great. And from the start. Yes, hurrah, right. So, uh, good, good morning everybody, I'm David Lane from the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics. Um, Peter, I think, has done a great job uh, reminding us of the scale of the opportunity in robotics autonomous systems, you know, the McKinsey report. Bernard's done a great job, I think, showing us in a more qualitative way what, what the opportunity might look and feel like. What I want to do is try to do the transition from that very high-level view, an optimistic view perhaps, to what we're going to get later in the day, which is more about some of the exciting science that's going on um, around the world from our various presenters we've got here today, and talk a little bit about how do we, what are the, the things that we do in order to realise some of the benefit from the, from the science that we're going to hear about. And I'm going to do that in two ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Peter referred to there, which is some work that a group of us did um, on behalf of the previous uh, universities minister, David Willits, about robotics, which is really trying to answer that question. What are the sorts of interventions that we should be doing in the UK in order to try and realize some of that, uh, some of that benefit uh, to, to the nation? And I'm also going to talk probably more interestingly, perhaps, about my own personal experiences doing some of that in marine robotics, which is my area, because I've spent some time working in academia, but I've also spent time outside academia working in the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, as a dirty contractor, as we sometimes call it, in the, in the commercial world. And uh, some experiences there, I think, to some extent, have informed what we've done in the strategy. And at the end, I'm going to show some cool stuff that we're doing in the lab, simply because everybody else is going to do that, and I want to make sure I've done it as well. <laughs> um, uh, Peter was kind enough to mention the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics. I'm going to give it a plug. Uh, my colleague, Sethi Vijakuma, he's on after the break. Um, he'll be talking some more about the work that he's doing at Edinburgh University. The pair of us together have been working hard over the last few years to set this up. It's a 35 million pound joint venture between Harriet Watt and Edinburgh. Our ambition is to do 100 PhD students who are what we call innovation ready over the next five years. So we want to produce a generation of students coming out who are not only technically excellent in, in the areas of, of the scientific endeavor, but they also get it about what it takes to do this translational thing later on. They've, been ex they've met a venture capitalist, for example, and they've had some tra training in that. So it's quite an ambition, and I won't go into the details here, but we've got a center for doctoral training and lots of equipment investment and so on. And we work a lot with industry, not only the, the companies that sponsor us, but these are some of the businesses that we're either licensing to or that we've spun out from the, from the center over, over recent years. So again, without going into it, you know, that agenda for us is, uh, uh, is, is quite important. If you've heard me say this before, I apologize, you're gonna hear, hear me say it again. Um, there's a very big difference for me between two words that, that seem very similar. Uh, one's invention, the other's uh, innovation. They sound the same, um, but they mean to me very different things. And I always like to have a very clear uh, definition in my mind to, to distinguish them. So invention for me, it's, a bit, it's, it's research, it's doing the underpinning science. It's the process of taking money, usually always somebody else's money in my experience, um, and turning it into ideas. So the output from invention, from research, is, is ideas. Innovation for me is the, the process of taking those ideas and turning them back into money again. Okay. Take ideas, turn it back into money. And the subject matter, it doesn't matter what it is, robotics in our, in our case, you know, it'll be the same stuff that you're doing both with invention and innovation. But the things that you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what your day consists of, are very, very different. 
And really the challenge that we face UK PLC, if we're to, if we're to get the benefit of, of, of the opportunity and to derive the wealth, um, is figure out how do we do that innovation? What are the things we do to take the, the ideas from the fantastic research base that we have here and the great investments and the, and the great citation counts that we have in our science and turn those back into, uh, uh, turn those back into money again? In 2012, I think it was, we first sat down and had a round table with David Willits, those of us who were doing uh, robotics, and Andrew Blake, I think, chaired that, uh, and a group of us were there. And from that stemmed about two years of work, where under, with the guidance of uh, the Knowledge Transfer Network, we had a committee, um, and many of us in the room contributed to trying to answer that question. What is it that UK should do in order to get some of that translation from the invention to get the innovation mo moving properly. And without going into too much detail, we'd, we spent some time identifying the scale of the opportunity. I won't linger on that. We'd recognised that there were opportunities in the private sector, but also in the public sector, that smart procurement in the public sector was something where, where the government becomes customer is one of the very important things that government can do in order to support the development of spin-outs and, and innovation. Because Businesses, ultimately, they, they need bits of money to kickstart them, but ultimately what they need are customers. And there's a huge opportunity there, and I'll, I'll come back to that later on. But we ended up with a strategy that had five strands in it. Um, we recognised that there was a skills agenda that needed to be addressed. I'm not going to go into that. We recognised that clusters were important, so finding ecosystems that were geographically located and capitalising on those strengths of businesses working with industry, that's important. It's, it's fairly generic. But the two things I want to focus on that are important from this are um, one of them about assets and one of them about challenges, because those are two things that certainly in my experience have been very important in doing that translation and deriving value from um, the, the research that we do. So assets, I'll say a little bit about first. So the idea was that it's very important to have places we can take our systems, or, and I'll say systems to build on Bernard's uh, uh, earlier points, um, take our systems to de-risk them in realistic environments. So that means we have to have places we can go where we can do the TRL, Technology Readiness Level 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, both to de-risk the technology, but also to build trust with customers. That's very important. Um, and also to be able to demonstrate what our, what our technology can do. And here's some examples of the different kinds of asset environments that we, we envisage, from you know, offshore oil rigs, uh, hamlet of houses. Um, some of the things we're starting to see in Milton Keynes, for example, with the, the pods driving around on the, you know, the smart cities agenda, starting to develop um, hospitals, uh, drone deliveries, and so on. So we recognised that was important. The other side of assets we'd recognised was um, what we call intangible assets. So it's the regulatory environment. If we can get the regulatory environment right, that means that we can um, uh, overseas businesses, large businesses generally, will come to the UK in order to de-risk their technology because the regulatory environment um, is, is the most favourable for us to do that. Um, we also talked about doing challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the context of uh, marine robotics. So I'm going to switch now from the sort of generic strategy stuff into something more personal and more um, from, my own, from my own experience, just to try and illustrate some of the things I'm talking about. So I've worked for the longest time in conjunction with the oil and gas business, and one of the sort of early applications of advanced robotics is in uh, inspection, repair, and maintenance um, around subsea uh, infrastructure, and particularly the sort of early business um, opportunities were around what they call floating production systems, or FPSOs, where you've got a lot of stuff sitting underneath the, in this case it's, a, it's like a ship on the surface, you've got a lot of risers and wellheads and so on, which all has to be inspected, all has to be repaired, and all has to be maintained. And the traditional way of doing it originally was using divers, but divers can't go deep. So these days it's been done by robots, but these robots are all teleoperated, they have umbilical cables, they have guys on the surface, ROVs they're called, um, and in deep water there's a lot of issues with that. Um, not least the expense of having the surface ships there which you deploy the, uh, uh, deploy the, the robots from. So there's a commercial opportunity and a business model that wraps around using autonomous vehicles, vehicles with no physical connection to the surface, to do the inspection and then latterly some of the, the, the intervention and, and maintenance operations. So I want to talk a little bit about the journey. And we've had a journey which has gone to commercial systems that do some of this stuff, right? Um, this is 2003. Um, it's a group of us in an EU program called Alive. So there's some French people, there's Ifrema, there's Cybernetics, there's uh, High Tech in Norway, and, and some other Italians. Um, and what we're doing was developing an AUV 
that can be deployed from a, deployed from a surface vessel, autonomously navigate to uh, a subsea structure that has a docking panel on it, valves, and the mission is to go and turn a valve. Turn a valve from one angle to, to another angle, that, that represents success. Lots of applications in the oil and gas business. We built a system that did that. There's some great science going on here in uh, visual surveying from sonar, using optical flow in order to localize the vehicle so that you can get to the right position and then do the dock. And ideally, we would have had some great sort of active compliant manipulation technology, but we didn't, so we just relied on passive compliance and we sort of closed our eyes and crossed our fingers and hoped it all worked when it came to do, came to do the dock. This was great. But it was a real look ma no hands kind of experience. It was you know, a bunch of researchers sitting around with laptops everywhere, you know, code screaming up on the, on the you know, and it worked once, twice. You know, and it's not something that you could robustify and, and, and take offshore. But it was a great success uh, in, in, in its time. Roll forward 10 years to 2013-ish. This looks pretty similar, right? It's yellow, right? <laughs> This is called the Autonomous Inspection Vehicle. This is a commercial vehicle. It's run by a company called Subsea 7 up in Aberdeen. Many of you have seen this before. I apologize if you've maybe played this too often. Um, but it, it's doing commercial work now for uh, Subsea 7, working for Shell. Um, and it does inspection. It doesn't do repair and maintenance at the moment. No manipulator on it. Right? But it's completely autonomous. It's got a map of the subsea structure in it, you know, which is the, the, where the risers and the manifolds are. It navigates its way around that. Um, it's got some sort of independent decision making. It can script switch in order to be able to, if it sees something interesting, it can move in close to get a closer picture of it. And what it does is bring back data. It brings back the inspection data that can be then be used for, for the, uh, the sort of life of field asset integrity management process that the old, the old companies go through. Um, this is a, a system which is designed to be operated by guys who work offshore who have big hands. They like to have two buttons, one marked on, one marked off, and they press the button. Not quite as simple as that, but it's a much more robust system. So there was a journey there over 10 years about what is it that we did to try and get, get ourselves from the, that early prototype to something that's a commercial system that's being used by, by a large company. Um, it wasn't a case of uh, just instantly getting to that uh, system and being able to sell it to the oil companies or to the, 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 the operators, or the contractors and the, and the operators, right? Um, we had to go on a journey. And this is what, what, th what you're seeing here. This is a remotely operated vehicle. This was the thing that blew away. It's got an umbilical cable on it. It's not autonomous, right? It's one of the current systems that gets used deep water gulf of Mexico. Um, this blew away the, uh, the ROV pilots. And the reason is it's not moving. And now when it does move, it does a 90 degree turn and it just sits there right? and doesn't do anything. You might have seen the propeller was turning. So there's a current running. So, the, so what's happening is the vehicle is just sitting there, not moving. That was a huge value to the industry at that time. Why? Because ROV pilots who are good are hard to come by. There's a skills shortage in ROV piloting as the oil and gas business has expanded. So having a decent autopilot system that can do that, that can stabilize the vehicle, was of huge value to them. We were all out there going, we've got this autonomy, we can do all this autonomous stuff. What they actually wanted to start with was something that could start to make their, we say dumb iron smart, smart start to make their, their vehicle smarter, just those simple autopilots. Um, there were also other advantages when it came to doing manipulation. This is all teleoperated manipulation. But by having a stable platform, um, which we have here, doing up a shackle in a subsea assembly task um, can be done quite accurately. What we're going to switch to in a minute um, is an example of trying to do that with the R a very experienced ROV pilot trying to drive the, the ROV at the same time as to operate the manipulator. And what you'll see is that it's very difficult to line everything up, right? The thing's moving in six degrees of freedom. You've got another eight degrees of freedom on the manipulator. And, and the bit they didn't allow us to show was that just after this, the pilot dropped the pin from the shackle. <laughs> the pin fell down. Um, and that was a huge problem, because then you had to go and find it. It took time. And if you're working from a vessel that costs $60,000 a day, you know, these sorts of simple things are the things that um, were actually going to move the needle in terms of what the industry needed at the time. So what we learned was there was a series of baby steps that you have to do to go from this, you know, the vision that we have of this autonomous system, uh, the simple things that the industry wants. And actually, you have to pay attention to the requirements in the industry and understanding those requirements are the things that should inform how you, uh, uh, how you take your technology out. Um, <coughs> this is my asset 
picture, right? Realistic environments. You know, we spent a lot. It's one thing to do. Uh, this is a bunch of guys from the Ocean Systems Lab. Most of these guys at Heriot. Most of these guys are now working inside one of our spin-outs, Seabite uh, Limited, which is doing all that AI, AIV stuff. Um, you know, being able to operate in those realistic environments was very important for us in order to transition the technology. We had to get out of the lab and get out of the Scottish sea lochs, which is where we were going, um, and get to sea, no matter what the cost and no matter what the effect on your uh, uh, digestive system. So we work quite hard working with people like the Underwater Centre up in Fort William, um, who normally do diver training. That's really their role, or ROV pilot training. But we're trying to turn them into a place where we can do a, a testing of autonomous robots. And there's various schemes afoot to try and try and develop some of that. And you'll see some examples of some mapping type stuff we've been doing on, uh, uh, on projects recently. So that's really important. So this is one very practical example of an asset. This is an asset we want to continue to develop for doing um, uh, further marine robotics work. And look at the ways that we can instrument this to do some of the kind of intervention tasks that I'm going to show you examples of. Um, later on. And indeed, I'm delighted to say, perhaps slightly prematurely, there is some thinking going on inside Scottish Enterprise at the moment about, you know, what, are there some ways that we can develop a deep water asset on an oil field called Shehalion, which is west of Shetland. It's a relatively deep water system. It's got FPSOs. It's starting to be decommissioned. And so there's an opportunity for us there to instrument up some of that as a test bed where companies like Subsea 7 and others in the oil and gas business can go and de-risk and test some of their um, uh, their systems and their operations before they then go to the Gulf of Mexico or offshore West Africa earning real money work, working for oil companies. And there's a huge safety aspect to that as well as a technology aspect. So we're very hopeful that that asset um, uh, uh, approach will continue. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges. I'm not going to show quite so much about that, but I'm going to, going to mention it. One of the things that happened to us that was delightful, not in the oil and gas space, but this is actually in the, in the naval space, working mainly in the US, I have to say. And maybe later on we're going to hear some examples of DARPA challenge type work, which is more generic robotics. Um, we found ourselves working with uh, the United States Navy, in particular the Office of Naval Research, um, um, and working with those guys and alongside, would you believe, US Navy procurement, you know, we learned a huge amount about requirements and about what it takes in order to take some of this technology and, and uh, work in conjunctions with users, in this case there were you know, guys in uniform on the left hand side, to understand what is it they want for their operational capability in, uh, uh, in this case it was, for, it was for mine warfare. And so what we used to do was turn up every year annually to a thing called AUV Fest, Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Fest, where all the people that were being sponsored by ONR, Office Naval Research, who would come along. And we'd all, we'd all been tasked to do different things during the year. And we'd all turn up, and in, in a challenge sense, we'd all go to Panama City in Florida, and we'd, and we'd all run our stuff. Um, and some of it would work, and some of it wouldn't work. But what we were doing was working alongside, the technology guys were working alongside, in this case, the users, the guys who were in uniform. And they could see something of what we could do. They would say, actually, I don't like that. What I really want to do is, is this. And they were able to do it in a way that they didn't need to tell us all about their, you know, their, their secret concepts of operations. It was just about the capability that they, they needed. And over, and here's the point, over a sustained period, you know, of in this sort of four to five to six years, right, we would turn up regularly to do this. We'd work with the program managers. Um, and um, what we got into was a kind of requirement spiral. So it's a bit like the same thing as we did with the AIV and those baby steps, where we um, were able to de-risk solutions so that when it came to a procurement, Right? We, were, we had the, the, the customer knew what was available, we had something that could answer the requirements in the procurement, and, and we were able to abide by all the federal acquisition regulations, it was a fair competition, um, but capability was delivered to the, to the guys in the field. It took four or five years, it took, a lot, it took time, and so some of the schemes we have over here, we started to have over here, Innovate UK, SBIRs, um, are great, are taking us in the right direction, but we need to have much more of that kind of thing because the technology people sort of know what the technology can do, but they don't know what the users really need. The users don't know what the technology can do, so they don't know how to ask for it. Right? And there's only one way you're going to get over that, and that's to have them working together. So finding ways to do that, it was a great model. How do we take that out into other kinds of public procurement? You know, using, you know, should drones be replacing helicopters in the police force, for example? And, and many other examples. You know, there are ways that we can, we can develop that. So we learned a lot from, from doing that. Just to finish off and try and get us back onto, uh, back onto track, I'm going to show you some new and cool stuff that we've been doing in the lab. This is um, a group of us from uh, research groups in uh, King's College here in London, Harriet Watt, 
IIT in Genoa, um, the National Technical University in Athens, um, and we're working, just finished a project called Pandora, and what we're trying to do is do some of the um, uh, invention part before it gets to innovation. And we'd shown you earlier on, you'd seen examples of how you know, we were doing uh, the manipulation back in 2003 uh, with the Alive system, look, my no hands, you know, we were really crossing our fingers to make sure the manipulation part of that worked. There was a kind of CAD model of the, where everything should be, you were docked on, and it was reasonably rigid. The hydraulics moved a bit, but not too much. Right? What we're doing here is, A, working from a moving base, trying to do the same thing. But the key thing is we've been using machine learning techniques and probabilistic robotics in order to do skill learning. So we're trying to, and we're going to hear more about this later on this afternoon from other people. Um, so in, how do you teach the robot the behavior you want it to do? Right? Um, you can program it, that's one way, that's not very good. But wouldn't it be much better if you could somehow mimic what the human does? But, but in a more sophisticated way than uh, would be done in, say, a manufacturing environment where it's a kind of teach and learn and remembering joint angles on a robot and then you can paint the car. So we're doing it probabilistically here because that gives us a much better ability to um, offset disturbances. And what we might be seeing in one of these here is, is where... Um, you see the, there's, a, there's a propeller at the right-hand side. That should switch on in a minute. And what you'll see is the vehicle trying to localize itself, but also offset the disturbance. So even though there's a current running, it can, it can offset that and then go in and, and, and turn the valve. And that's been very exciting. We've got that to the point where we're doing it now quite successfully and routinely, in this case, in, with colleagues in the University of Girona, in the test tank environment. Um, uh, the next thing we have to do is try and get that out into more realistic offshore environments using the assets, which is the thing that I was talking about uh, earlier on. Um, the same machine learning techniques we've also used here for doing other kinds of tasks. So here what we're seeing is, and these are other typical um, offshore tasks that are very important. We're doing uh, 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 inspecting of anchor chains. These are really important because the floating production system is sitting there. It's basically a ship that's anchored on site and you have to do regular cleaning and inspection of the anchor chains. So we've been doing, doing that autonomously um, and there's quite a lot of work on sonar mapping and mosaicing in order to find out where the anchor chain is. Um, and at the bottom right there, there has been some work taken out offshore, but it still needs to be robustified and, and, and taken out. Um, and then finally, um, this is showing fault recovery. So one of the benefits of using these kind of probabilistic approaches here is that if you have failure, and, and this is, plays to the sort of verification and validation agenda, which is very important for reliable operations and safe operations, um, you know, you have a, in our case, we're trying to just simply drive the vehicle from one place to another. If you have a thruster failure on the way, um, you know, if you don't know or have something built into the system that can deal with that, then the, the vehicle will just go somewhere completely different. And so using these machine learning techniques, what we're seeing in the right-hand video is that you can move from, the, you might, you can get to the desired target. You might not be pointing in the right direction, but at least you're in the right place, right, which means you don't lose the vehicle uh, and it always comes back. So, you know, there's a lot of very interesting things that come from these probabilistic and, and machine learning approaches to, uh, 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 to marine robotics. So here are my four takeaway messages, and I'm hoping I'm getting us back onto track. Peter's come up right on cue. Um, but I think with the, my, my, le my lessons learned and my, my message to you, you know, you know, baby steps is the way to go. You might have a great vision about how your autonomous car is going to be on the highway. And actually, we're seeing that already in the way it's coming about, that the, there are... You know, smaller capabilities about being automatic parking, reversing, you know, lane changing, that, that kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's the way to go because it builds trust in the user community and with the public. And that's a very important part of how, how adoption takes place. Assets and challenges around them, and the DARPA Grand Challenge, we'll probably hear about this later on, another great example, right? Those are the things that breed innovation from our invention. Those are the things that move the needle, they did it with the autonomous car, right? That move the needle from the science in the lab to something that's working up at the high TRLs where you know, large companies, you get to the tipping point where the public money, which comes from government generally, you know, is completely irrelevant because the amount of large-scale industry money that's making it happen just blows it away. And that happened to us with the, the AIV. The public, you know, it was done on private money from uh, Subsea 7. Smart procurement provides customers for new businesses. We learned that from the US Navy. I think there's huge opportunities in government in the way that they can do, they, they can help small businesses have customers. That's the thing they ultimately need. And if you want to know where the treasure is, I learned this, it's in the requirements. Thank you very much. <coughs> And thank you, David, for an excellent, an excellent talk. Now, uh, I'm going to reverse, just to mix things up, I'm going to try to reverse the order and ask you from the floor to ask some questions before I deal with the ones that I have 
um, submitted electronically. So you've had some caffeine at the beginning. It must have filtered through your veins by now. You must be stimulated to have something to say. So uh, let's see some hands. Yes, excellent. So, David, uh, hey. I don't have a microphone. It's coming behind me. Ah, very good. Sorry. There we go. Um, so great narrative about going from prototype to product, mm -hmm. but uh, and, and you mentioned trust. How do you guarantee that, or is it important that you guarantee that your device always works? And if you can't yet guarantee it, how are you going to get to be able to provide guarantees of safety and reliability? So with something like AIV, um, it, it's very difficult to do a sort of formal methods thing that says this you know, formal ver verification and validation. So what did we do? We, we, just, we, we broke it down into all this software and hardware into the, the smallest components and just tested everything as thoroughly as we possibly could. We had simulation, but we do a lot of hardware in the loop type work, so we had simulation environments where we could run the real flight code and the real computing in as realistic environment, software environment as we could, and we just left it running for days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks. And we didn't really take it to see as a, an operational system until we'd worked out all the bugs you know, at, at that level. That was hugely beneficial. So, so it was by trial and error or testing, ba basically, um, and, and experience. That was hugely beneficial when we got it offshore. Of course, when you get it offshore and you get the real vehicle in the real environment with the real sensor data, it's different, right? But at least you know you've shaken out all of the sort of intrinsic bugs because of the way you wrote the software type of stuff, right? Um, and then it's just a case of putting hours on the vehicle, you know? Yeah. Is that, is that scalable? Is that how autonomy is going to make progress over the years? Um, or is it, are we going to hit a limit with that into getting to real products? Yeah. I, I think there's, there's, it's an area of research. I mean, Bernard mentioned earlier on the whole systems, the whole systems piece. Because these, are, these robots are not just robots that sit in isolation. They are part of an information infrastructure. You know, ro robots are the arms and legs of big data. You know, is, is the kind of thing that we've, we've, we've used. Or arms, legs, and sensors of big data. So there's a systems approach, and I think there is scope for to look more at the formal methods for, for validation and verification. But the reality of trying to do it on the ground now is that when you've got a team of guys who are trying to do something, you just be careful about how you put it together and test it like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some more questions? Yes, we have one center. Uh, David, you talked about assets. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that people and know-how is an asset? And if so, um, what, in, what we need to do in the country to uh, enable that, protect it, take it forward? Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. We have, an, we have lots of places that, are, that belong to government in many, case, in many cases, where you know, we have airfields, we have uh, mines, the Bulby Mine, for example. STFC runs that where government already has, or some organization already has something that can be the basis of an asset. The key to establish, there's a danger with asset that you, that you build something and it turns out to be a white elephant because nobody ever uses it, right? So there's a key bit of thinking you have to do about the business model that sustains, sustains, sustains the asset that people will come along and use it. And that partly means you have to have industrial buy. It's like, it's like the sort of batteries not included thing. You can set it up, but if you don't have people coming along to use it, it won't, it, yeah. So you need to have businesses that have a, a, a pressing need to come along and try this stuff. And so as new businesses are formed to address some of these market opportunities, you know, they're the people that will come and use it. But having dual use business models is important. So in the case of the underwater center up in Fort William, you know, it's doing training. So there's some other stuff that it does you know, about the skill, addressing the skills agenda, as, which goes in parallel with the sort of de-risking the technology agenda. And trying to design those business models is key. I, it, it's doable because the underwater center exists. I think we just have to scale, have to scale that in different, um, uh, uh, different verticals. Yeah. Okay, yes, well, Bernard. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm pointing to, the, to, to Bernard, but the, the microphone's disappearing to the back. Someone else is coming with one, don't worry, it's, it's heading your way. <coughs> okay, Dave, great, great project. Uh, just one question, what where, where do you think are the biggest challenge for the researcher, on the student, or on the people working on those projects? What, does, what are the biggest difficulties and challenges, and how do you think we could help? Wow, that's a big question. What's the biggest difficulties and for the students? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Do you know the biggest challenge, I think, for a, for, certainly for a PhD student, is learning how to ask the question 
It's a very sort of generic thing. Right? Everything you do in your education up until you get to do your PhD, somebody else has packaged the problem for you, and what you get to be really good at is sort of turn the handle and you know, do the maths and write the code and whatever it is, and, 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 and solve it. You know? When you do your PhD, you know, what, what you get given is a blank sheet of paper. And, you, <laughs> and it's amazing. Students struggle with a blank sheet of paper because you have to define the problem. Right? And, and, being, and as, as you know, we become ever more successful, and, and robotics is very multidisciplinary, so you know, we've, we've, you've got everything from sort of deep computer science and machine learning through to embodiments and, so, and soft materials. You know. So trying to understand what is your problem, what is your niche, I think for, for a, from a student's point of view, that, that, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge. And that leads on to then the whole multidisciplinary thing and your systems point, actually, because, you know, it's a system. It's got, you know, it's a, it's a soft body. If some of the intelligence is in the body and not in the computing, you know, how, how do you build systems that, that, that perform to a specification that meet that? And, and it's a broad scientific background that you need in your underpinning skills in order to be able to, to, to address that. So I would say that would be my answer. Well, I think that raises an interesting question yeah. that I'd like to discuss later, is yeah. whether the training that we have already in yeah. place is the right training for yeah. systems uh, yeah. perspectives, uh, which yeah. will undoubtedly be part of the future. Yeah. I, I think in view of the time, um, and I'm delighted to see hands coming up, so just keep your questions. A lot of them are generic and I'm sure can come to the, to the other speakers, but in view of the time, I think we're going to call a halt now. We'll have some coffee and we reconvene at 11.15 for Andrew Blake's yeah. talk. So thank David again. Thank you very much for both the speakers. Thank you.